Hello everyone and welcome to Mr. This is South America, and here is Colombia. Now, let's have a look around, shall we? A little smaller than Peru, Colombia is nevertheless the second most biodiverse country in the world. That means, after Brazil, no country has so many different sorts of animals and trees and flowers as Colombia. And this bulging, intricate tapestry of life is what greeted the land's first inhabitants, trekking their way down the narrow Panamanian neck and into the forehead of South America, which is today's Colombia. As the millennia passed, various separate cultures formed, some hunting for their livelihood, others tilling the soil. One mysterious early civilization, named after a nearby town, was part of that whole monolith carving craze of ancient times. This figure looks like he's trapped in the rock and trying to get out. Later we see the Kimbaya people crafting their rose-tinted gold and copper alloy statuettes, and the Muisca, also called the Chibcha, who rank among the most advanced of all Amerindian civilizations. The Muisca did not build grand stone structures, preferring smaller, more rotund buildings of cane, clay, and wood. But they were fine artisans and astronomers, and great miners of salt and emeralds, and indeed, most of the world's emeralds come from Colombia. Next door to the Muisca were the Muza, a much more unpleasant people, always waging war on their neighbors, and rumored to be cannibals. They hunted with arrows coated in curare poison. In 1498, South America was sighted by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus, whom Colombia is named after, though he never set foot on present-day Colombia's territory. The Spanish set about conquering the land from 1525, with Rodrigo de Bastidas, who founded the city of Santa Marta on the northern coast. Soon, other cities were popping up including the capital Bogota, and exploration of this colony, then called New Granada, accelerated at an abnormal rate. Why so expeditious? Greed. You see, a cluster of stories and legends somehow got all mingled and transmuted into the idea that somewhere inland lay a glistening city of gold. So conquistadors like Gonzalo Jiménez de Quisada set off in search of El Dorado, which they never found. Still, Spain had acquired a considerable mass of land, and in order to capitalize on it, brought in a number of slaves from Africa to work on the farms and in the mines. Though there was little hope in those rapacious days of stemming the ignoble tide of slavery, the Catholic Church did what it could to aid the unfortunate captives, with men like Pedro Claver devoting their lives to the well-being of slaves and fighting for their rights. So the years went by, and Spain made a hefty profit from New Granada, and the scent of those fattening finances found its way to the nostrils of Britain. In 1739, Britain declared war on Spain, simply for the sake of money. But Spanish victory at battles like Cartagena de Indias devastated the British and dampened their hopes for muscling in on trade in the Americas. But war costs a lot of money, and a rise in taxes spurred a revolt, and the anger did not simply dissipate afterwards. Unhappy with Spain's policies, the Spanish colonies in the Americas began shuffling towards revolution. Colombia declared independence in 1810, and so war erupted with Spain, with Colombia led by men like Francisco de Paula Santander, and later, the Libertador himself, Simón Bolívar, whose victories against Spain in battles like Boyarca ensured Colombian independence. In 1851, slavery was abolished, but all Already there was dissension between the liberal and conservative parties, leading to war. And more war, leaving a lot of people dead. Now, American involvement in the Panama Canal venture led to Panama separating from Colombia and becoming a country itself. And then Colombia fought a war with Peru over land in the Amazon. Then Colombia had some peace and quiet. And then it didn't! From the 1948 assassination of socialist politician Jorge Elesia Gaitán to the late 1950s, Colombia underwent a time of extraordinary politically motivated violence called La Violencia. And not simply because over two 200,000 people were killed, but because the killings were often excessively gruesome and grisly in nature. The liberals and conservatives agreed to a resolution, but the violence was far from ready to subside. Communist groups such as Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, embittered at the country's trajectory, started growing, and conflict with government forces arose. The 1970s saw the rise in narcotics, with Colombian drug lords like Pablo Escobar making billions distributing cocaine to the United States. Escobar's charity to the poor of Medellin made him a hero among the people, but he ended up shot to death by the the Colombian police in 1993. Under President Álvaro Uribe, effective campaigns against armed rebels were made. His successor, Juan Manuel Santos, negotiated a peace treaty with FARC, for which he received the Nobel Peace Prize, a treaty disapproved of by his successor, which itself sparked protests. Anyway, despite its tumultuous 20th century, Colombia has made immense improvements and attained a high human development index score and the third biggest economy in South America, and given the world quite a bit, from one of the world's greatest writers, Gabriel García Márquez, to pop singer Shakira, and cycling sensation Nairo Quintana. What awaits Colombia in the years ahead? Comment below, but for now, bye bye!